Tonight our panel is the Conservative International Development Secretary, Justin Greening, Labour's Chuko Muna, who returned to the back benches rather than serve in Corbyn's shadow cabinet, the Green Party's first appointment to the House of Lords, Jenny Jones, the Mail on Sunday columnist, Peter Hitchens, and the writer, broadcaster and professional poker player, Victoria Corrin Mitchell. From Zaid Ahmed, please. Would you support junior doctors if they decide to go on strike? Would you support junior doctors if they decide and to go and come back? Peter Hitchens. I, I don't think doctors should ever go on strike. I, I just don't think it's something they should do. Uh, I th it's, it's one of those things where you, you, you have to say, this is a job which requires you to be available at all times. And I, I doesn't mean I don't sympathise with the case. It just means I think that the strike weapon is not one you can use. I, the other thing which seems to me to be very noticeable is that the doctors have completely ceased to trust Mr Hunt and there doesn't really seem to be any real communication between them. I very much hope uh, that the government finds some way of reaching a settlement which doesn't involve the doctors strike for the sake of all the patients who will suffer as a result of that because they will. These, I remember as an industrial reporter, any pledge one ever had from any group that the, the, the public would not suffer from any withdrawal of emergency, emergency service was never actually fulfilled. It always does hurt people. So I think that it should be avoided, but I think it may have to be avoided by Mr Hunt departing and being replaced by somebody better able to negotiate. Yeah, just, just, yeah. Following the suspected bombing of a Russian aeroplane in Egypt this week, is it time to take full military action against IS? Peter Hitchens. Uh, no. Uh, first of all, it's suspected and not proven, and we shouldn't rush to do things of this kind. Secondly, the idea that taking military action against Islamic State is going to reduce the terrorist risk is an absurdity. Uh, it, the, the military action which this country and the United States in particular have taken in the Middle East and the other interventions which you've undertaken in the Arab world over the past 10 or 15 years, and indeed in Afghanistan, have increased the risk to us repeatedly. We have no idea what we're doing in these places. We destroyed the stability of Iraq and replaced it with the chaos out of which IS grew. Uh, we've destabilized Syria and turned millions of, of, of reasonably contented people into corpses and refugees. Uh, we wrecked Libya and turned that into a failed state with our brilliant intervention there. What is it that makes us think still, after all these stupid, unforgivable failures of incompetence and, uh, and, and ignorance that we are going by another military intervention suddenly to make it all right. It really is time that as a country we realize that we have <laughs> two well, ISIL is a threat to the UK. We've seen that and we need to take steps to deal with it. At the moment, we're part of the coalition action against ISIL in Iraq, but of course ISIL's also in Syria and we're not able to be part of taking action against them. So we've got half a strategy, which is why what we want to do is build a consensus so that we can win a vote in Parliament to actually have a proper strategy that means we can also play our role in trying to tackle ISIL in Syria. And in the meantime, of course, the other thing we need to see is for the Russians to actually be part of that coalition tackling ISIL rather than doing what they're doing at the moment, which is actually bombing the Free Syrian Army and the Syrian moderate opposition is going to be part of Syria's future, so they shouldn't be taking action against ISIL. Can, 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 can I just challenge yeah. that? The, the, this constant uh, chorus from the government about these moderates in Syria. The moderates in Syria are exactly the same people who they urge us to be on guard against in schools and everywhere else in Britain. They're not moderates. Uh, they are, they are, they're, they're, they're utterly and completely dedicated to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the extremist Islamic cause. And we propose to back them because actually British foreign policy is not made in London anymore. It's made in Saudi Arabia. And our, 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 our attitude towards all these things is, 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 is governed by our desire to please Saudi Arabia. And all right, no, no just, other sense. All right, Peter, ju ju uh, Justin, just reply to that, and then I'll come to you in the second row. Thank you. Um, I actually met the leader of the Syrian moderate opposition in Parliament yesterday. He wasn't the kind of person that you've just talked about. These are people who are standing up against a brutal Assad regime that's barrel bombing ordinary civilians in Syria. They talked to me about how there are half a million Syrians now who are totally cut off from any help that can be provided to them. And they need the rest of the world to 
provide assistance and also to help them tackle ISIL too, so that in the end of this, when we do reach a political settlement, there's a Syria there for them to build a future again in. How can you? How can right, you? Right, how, right, no, right, no, I'm sorry. No, how can, how can you claim to be? Right, how can you claim to be against the supposed tyr tyranny of Assad when this week your prime minister has welcomed uh, the leader of Egypt, who recently killed hundreds of his own people <laughs> and runs a regime if not as repressive as Assad, similarly repressive? Right, how can you claim you. to be principal, principled in, the, in, in this matter? You're right. You're well, not. Let's just stop there, and then we'll go on to another one. Yes. I think Notch and P. Hitchin is talking absolute nonsense in terms of Syria. By not intervening, we would like to enter a bloody mess, and people have turned to extremism because of that. No, fact, if you look at the, no, if let you him finish the point. If you look at the facts, you will clearly see that ISIS grew because of the chaos that enveloped Syria. No, we, That's why we're dealing with it now. The chaos that enveloped Syria was, was caused by external destabilization. Yeah. Not uh, which at all. Came, which came, which came, regime, which came, which came, policies. which came out of the Gulf and was supported by the United States and by Britain and by France. Uh, in this curious belief that the, the Syrian regime, horrible though it undoubtedly is, uh, was in some way, as we claim, worse than anywhere, anyone else in the Middle East. In fact, that, that, that's simply not true. Barrel bombs are talked about. Nouri al-Maliki, our friend in Iraq, has used barrel bombs in Fallujah. There's hardly a Middle Eastern state, Bahrain, in which we've just opened a naval base, uh, uses torture and hideous repression against its people. Uh, and we have no principled objection to that. The idea that our objection to Syria is its tyranny is simply not true. And the other thing about this is the intransigence of the Syrian opposition, backed by us and the United States and by the Gulf, refusing to, to go to any negotiations in which, the, in which Assad did not go, has prevented any kind of attempts at a diplomatic solution now for years. And all the people who've been driven from their homes and killed and maimed during that time can turn to those who said, we will not negotiate unless Assad goes and say, why couldn't you make a compromise? Were our lives and our homes so unimportant to you by comparison to that, that you were prepared to demand that right, Peter, forever and you. ever? Jenny, that's, what, that's what's been going right, on. That's Jenny, the reason for it. Jenny James, briefly. Your question. Sean Wigan. Um, how do we house the high number of immigrants arriving, considering the shortage of council houses available for existing UK residents? How do we house? We had a lot of questions about housing uh, here in Tottenham tonight. How do we house the high number of immigrants arriving, considering the shortage of council houses available to I UK residents? I think for me, it's really important that young people growing up in London do feel like they've got the chance to get on the property ladder, and that means doing three... <laughs> it, means, it means doing... <laughs> It means doing three things. One is getting on with building more homes, and actually over the last few years we have seen more council homes built, we see more affordable homes built no, in no, London no, no, as no, well. No, sorry. Well, okay. The idea of let, young let people... Me, if, I can just, if I can just finish. Okay. So, so part of this is building more homes, including starter homes, which will be at 80% of the market value. Alongside that, then, it's helping young people be able to get the deposit that they need to be able to buy those homes as well which is where help to buy is making a big difference in reducing the amount of deposits that people need. And the last thing, though, is around many of the... I, first of all, it needs to be said that the idea that any young person, really, unless they're the child of a Russian oligarch, could live in London anymore, is preposterous. <laughs> Tottenham, which is, you know, not central London, in fact, it's one of the poorest places in Europe. In Tottenham, a one-bedroom flat can cost you £400,000. It's a stupid amount of money. 80% of it is a stupid amount of money. No one can afford to live here, and of course they could build more houses. How many council houses were built in London in the last year? Probably about 40. I mean, a ridiculous it's amount. It's, there needs to be a proper revolution. And I know it's, you would say it's easy for me to say that I'm not a politician, but I'm not, and it is, so I will. I think what has to happen is all of the young people and all of the workforce just have to leave London. They've got to just make themselves work somewhere else. The government has to find something to offer people outside London to regenerate other parts of the country, and they'll leave. And all these super wealthy people with their iceberg houses will be left with no nurses and no policemen and no firemen and no one to clean the houses and no one to deliver the mail to the houses and London will settle again. The last thing I want to say which is also very important is be very careful though about 
talking about immigration. It's not about immigration. This isn't a population problem. It's only very recently that London has returned to the population level of 1945. It's not the number of people. It's the cost of the houses and the type that are being built. All right. Yes, sir, the yeah, first of all, it's quite plain that our housing policy in this country has been a catastrophe for many years. And the, the, one of the things which has made it so was the, the sale of council houses, which everybody still says was wonderful, which I think we must recognize was a disaster. Uh, destroyed a huge amount of rented housing stock, incredibly valuable to people who had to work and needed to move to, move to work, and replaced it with the absolute catastrophe of housing benefit, which currently costs more than the Royal Air Force uh, to maintain and is an immensely expensive way of, of, of trying to house people. We've also repeatedly had governments which have sought to cover up their failure uh, to create a productive economy uh, by, by pumping up housing bubbles to try and sustain the economic figures and make themselves look good, during which time we have accumulated a national debt of 1.5 trillion pounds. 1.5 trillion pounds, completely unpayable. And this constant use of housing bubbles and of pumping money into housing to, uh, to, to, to try and save themselves from serious economic decisions has been one of the causes of the Are you saying there's a motive not to build houses? Well, there's a motive. Well, the, 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 the housing policy is not directed by any desire to build houses. The housing policy is directed to cover up for the fact that they failed to manage the economy of the country over, over several decades. But the, the, the final point, and Victoria, although a lot of what you said about housing in London was extremely sensible, and for, for Justin Green to sit there and imagine that young people can, can buy property in London, this is the best government that hedge funds could buy. And they obviously <laughs> spend time with nobody else but hedge fund managers if they think that any young people can afford houses. But the, 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 the problem that we also face is that how can a country uh, which has such a major problem in housing, how can it conceivably have, have a policy of undiscriminating, non-selective mass immigration at the same time? Uh, is this not guaranteed to cause greater problems than you already have? To say that the number of people make no difference is, Victoria, absurd. No, I didn't say the number of people make no difference. You said it, you said I it said it would be million. wrong to imagine that the population of London is too big because of immigrants, well, when I, it's only the I, same as it was in the I, I, I'm not, I don't live in London, I, and, and I, I recognise the existence of other parts of the country, but there is absolutely no doubt, and the, 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 the recent projections show that our population is rising towards 70 million at an astonishing rate. There is absolutely no doubt that there are a lot more people in oh, this country well, than there used to be, and a great, deal, a a great the, deal of them the, are the result of uncontrolled mass immigration, which we will not control. <laughs> and which, until we leave the European Union, we can't control. Well, would you agree, then? Let me just ask you this question. One important question. If you think one should be controlling the population where it's getting too big, and the main reason if the population is too big is because it's ageing, so people are living longer, how do we control that? Should we get rid of the old folk as well? Well, if you, if you have, as I say, a, a, a set of, circumstances, of existing circumstances, of which that may be one, it doesn't seem to me which have caused a major housing crisis and problems for almost anybody seeking to, to, to buy a house. It doesn't seem to me to be sensible to bring in a very large number of, of, of people who haven't got houses to live in no. at the same time. Okay. Isn't that elementary? Is, is, is we, don't, no, we, don't, we don't have a housing crisis because oh, of immigrants. No. We, don't, we have a housing crisis because we haven't built enough homes. All right. Are cuts to the police force endangering the public? Cuts to the police force. Are they endangering the public? The Met here in London believes it faces cuts of up to a billion over the next five years. The contributive factor to <clears throat> our problems with the police is mismanagement of what we can afford. It is too top heavy. You've got chief constables, deputy chief constable, assistant chief constable, <laughs> deputy assistant chief constable. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not making this up, it's a fact. But, all right. It's a, it's a fact. It's a fact. You got that. After that, you got chief superintendents. Then you got superintendents. Then you got chief inspectors. Then you got inspectors before you get to sergeants. And then, and, and, and then, look at the salary of our own commissioner in London here, four hundred thousand pounds a year. And I'm not talking about the extras. And then compare that salary with that of the constable, twenty-eight thousand. <coughs> All right, Peter Hitch, thank you very much. I get the point. I think we get the point, and we like the it's, list. It's, Peter a good, it's a good point, but at some years ago, I, I got tired of listening to the police complaining about how they couldn't do what they were supposed to do because they didn't have enough numbers. Uh, the truth is there are, th that for some years, there have been far more police officers in this country, both per head of the population and in, and, and in, in total, uh, than there were in the 60s when we had much more effective policing than we do now. The reason for the problem is that the police do the, the wrong 60s. thing. They're very nice, they're very, they're very nice people. Um, they're very nice people, but they do the wrong thing all the time. If, if you are burgled 
or if you are robbed or if you are mugged, uh, the police cannot unburgle you or unmug you or, 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 or unrob you. Nothing. They, they, are or, the cuts or they, in no, danger no, in the public, no, Peter? Is the question. No, no, I, we I know, only have I, a short time left. I know what left. the question is, but if yeah, you well, just have you cliche politics, no, let politi politicians run on, but let anybody who has anything original to say shut up. No, no Peter, I won't that, shut absolutely. Up. I will <laughs> not shut up about it because it is, it is so important. The police are supposed, and they were invented in this country by Robert Peel, to do one thing to patrol on foot the streets to prevent crime and disorder. That is something they no longer do. If they will start doing that again, we should pay them a king's ransom, all the money we've got. But at the moment, they won't do it. They vanish from the streets. Uh, they, they only turn up after things have happened. And quite frankly, that creates a demand that can okay. never conceivably okay. be I'll fulfilled. Be very, I have the this it's, it's very... Is the government turning our schools into joyless exam factories? Just very briefly, joyless exam factories. This is the news that seven-year-olds, according to the Secretary of State for Education, are now going to be tested uh, to see how they do. It, 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 is, it is true that this is what they are, and it's because it, rather than doing what needs to be done to the schools, that is to say bringing back proper rigorous education in the basics and, and selection in secondary schools on, on academic merit, uh, they insist on constantly reaching for gimmicks and on driving the schools and punishing the schools with incessant Stalinist five-year plans and exhortation. That's the only policy they have because they will not, for ideological reasons, do the only thing which would make the schools better. Victoria Curran, thank you, Peter.